Alright then, here we go again. Now, no big gap there at all this time. I just uh, waited long enough to uh, uh, check the video, uh, video I just made and uh, see how it came out and see if the music was uh, playing in the background there or uh, um, over taking my voice or whatever. Now I can hear my music on the radio there right now but now I have it so low that it's not coming over the uh, camcorder at all and I was hoping to have some kind of background music because I like that so I can't win when it comes to the music it seems like so I guess I'll have to just forget that one there for the time being now and I can very quickly see now how fast I'm losing my lighting here now as well it, um, it's almost five after seven now and um, um, hmm. I should turn the light, the light on above my head there for a little extra bit of lighting or, or, or what, or just leave it uh, as is. It is like a little bit of color in my face there now. Uh, it makes me think, you know, guys, it makes me uh, wonder what in heaven's name do all the other YouTubers do to get the good quality videos that they make? Clearly, they must invest hundreds and hundreds, and that's several thousand dollars into all the perfect equipment and so on that to make the kind of videos that they make, surely to get the right lighting, to get the right sound, um, you know, the whole works of it. Uh, good quality images and all the rest of it, uh, edit the, the videos the way they do and so on. Uh, they clearly must have a heck of a lot more stuff to work with than, than I even come close to having available to me right now sort of thing. So, uh, I have a light above me here now. I'll, I'll just turn that on and see how well that works. If it make it better or just uh, screw it up, well, I don't know. Now see, now, now I'll probably come out a little too washed out again, oh will I? Not too bad I suppose. Alright, well I see, you know all this now, just refer back to my old videos uh, for all the, the explanations for all this, I won't go into it again. There's another video on that video. Um, okay, so as I said now, it's uh, five after uh, seven, six after seven there now. Uh, July the uh, 29th, 2020. Wednesday, July 29th, 2020. And uh, just continuing on with my conversation here now. Oh, I've got to jump right into it. Uh, where I ended off there before. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, that, um, that's, the, that's, that's Newfoundland culture. I mean, we, 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 uh, we come from people that uh, uh, most were probably forced to leave Britain and Ireland and Scotland and all the rest of it because of hardships in their uh, native um, countries, their native homeland, so on and so forth. We, uh, we established ourselves here. Uh, we have established ourselves here to this day and uh, got communities, you know, all throughout uh, uh, Newfoundland, Newfoundland. Uh, still a very small population base though, we were about, about, about half a million people for the entire province, which is, you know, five, uh, 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 two, three, four, five hundred years of living here, two, uh, two to three hundred years of like consistent living here, uh, probably a couple hundred years before that just uh, intermediate uh, settlements, fishing, fishing settlements and all that sort of thing, you know, before people started to come here and decided that, that, that they would stay here all year round and establish themselves and so on because I mean uh, the first Europeans here to New, uh, Newfoundland, if anybody knows, for those who know, know the history of um, the European history of uh, North America in general, which of course would include New, uh, New, uh, Newfoundland, um, Uh, European people have been here for 500 plus years now, you know, and uh, so for the couple, first couple hundred years they just came, uh, did their fishing uh, throughout the uh, summer months and uh, went back to, uh, you know, England, Scotland, you know, where France, wherever they would go to, Portugal of course, because Portugal was, was a big, uh, um, uh, um, 
big a big uh, group of people, whatever that that uh, had a big influence here, uh, very very early on. Uh, the Portuguese fishing uh, fleets and all the rest were coming to you. Um, why? I mean, we may have some descendants here in Newfoundland from Portuguese people. I don't know. I mean, it's it's uh, if we do, they probably are a very very small uh, percentage of the overall population base there. But there might be some people that can trace their ancestry back to uh, Portuguese people on that shore. Because I mean, you know, they uh, they were among some of the very first people to come out of Newfoundland, and. Um, I would not be surprised if there weren't Portuguese people that decided to stay here, you know, and establish themselves, and there will be descendants of those people here, you know, to this day, you know. So, but uh, as I say, primarily it was the ones I've already mentioned: the Irish, the Scottish, the uh, English, and the French. Uh, uh, outside, of course, the uh, indigenous people that were here. That sadly we succeeded in annihilating, and that is the Beothic people. We're going to a whole video about that, but I certainly want to, uh, not, not, for, not for the purpose of this one. But uh, there, 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 there was the indigenous Beothic people that were here before any of the European people came here. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we, uh, we killed them off. I don't mind bringing it up because, like, it's a part. It's, it is also a part of our history and, and uh, something that we should uh, acknowledge and face and deal with. Accept that uh, we did do that. We we were we are one of the few groups of European people that actually succeeded. Where others, like even down in the states, attempted to probably annihilate certain uh, uh, First Nations groups or whatever, we here in Newfoundland actually succeeded. Whether that was the the um, intention, that was the outcome, because of the way we treated them, because of well, because of the, the areas that we denied to them for their, their fishing and their hunting that that they needed to survive, uh, they um, their numbers just gradually dwindled. We gave them our sicknesses and all the rest of it, so uh, a lot died off that way. And by the time we got our senses about us to try to. Uh, preserve the Beothic people, uh, had some heart and some, some sympathy and empathy for them sort of thing. It was too late then, you know, from what I've learned of the history of it sort of thing. There was only one lady left. They, they, they managed to sort of capture her, bring her here to St. John's sort of thing. She eventually learned English and she tried to communicate to, um, um, you know, the, the white people here. Uh, about her culture, her background, her beliefs, everything, you know, to try to preserve it sort of thing. We got a very tiny percentage of that recorded by her and she got sick herself and she, she passed away before, you know, she could uh, share with us so uh, a wealth of knowledge that's lost forever now, you know. And all because of our backwardness and our ignorance and not trying to look after these people more and not be so fearful of them and all that sort of thing. This also is what I am descended from, okay? And and I am very much aware that it is this kind of a mentality, this kind of, a, and again, I'm sorry for the Newfoundlanders that are gonna really hate me for what I'm about to say here now, but it is the facts of things, people whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Uh, uh, we have a, I wish I could find a tactful way of saying it, just a very ignorant, way of understanding things we don't like it's as if we don't want to understand things better or something you know uh, and that goes right across the board it's just with so many issues uh, Newfoundlanders don't seem to want to think more deeply about these things read about these things research these things understand these things better more deeply more thoroughly um, especially uh, rural Newfoundlanders, uh, uh, people from fishing villages and all the rest of it, they are so totally completely wrapped up in their traditional conventional lifestyles uh, and just uh, living each day, you know, just getting by and living each day sort of thing. They, they don't think beyond that. I grew up in that kind of environment, in, in, in rural rural uh, Newfoundland myself. I grew up in a kind of environment where People fished, people worked in a, worked in a fish plant. Uh, that was the primary industry, I think probably still is, uh, I saw tourism around my area. Uh, and 
everything that goes with growing up in that kind of very rural, traditional, conventional, um, uh, religiously oriented uh, type of atmosphere. Um, that still exists, actually, as far as I know, because I, I, I very seldom go, go back to back to my home now, uh, um, to this day. And I mean, I live here in St. John's, the capital of the province, but even here in St. John's, its influence is felt here as well. Uh, just people that just, they're ignorant about this, they're ignorant about that, they're ignorant about something else, world affairs, world politics, um, just, just ignorant in general. When like they're educated people, they they've got high school education. A lot of people got university education, so on. But they don't read things. They don't uh, inform themselves. They don't educate themselves. Um, I mean, I can go right across the board with any number of things I can bring up. Uh, we have an ongoing uh, problem here in uh, Newfoundland with our um, the, the state of our current current um, the current state of our fishing industry, for example. And uh, uh, how many uh, people in rural Newfoundland, you know, uh, grumble so much because they can't fish anymore without even wanting to understand the issues of the the, the, um, the problem more deeply of why they can't fish because of the fish stocks being low and the cod stocks being low, still being low. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why we're like it. I don't know why we choose to be like it. Uh, it's um, so very quickly now leading into the main thing I'm trying to get, uh, lead up to here. Mm -hmm. Growing up as a, uh, a gay individual in this kind of environment that has been very traditionally for several hundred years now and then even going back to the uh, cultures before that that were like this being traditional conventional and religious and all that sort of thing. <coughs> um, growing up in that kind of atmosphere as a, a gay individual or predominantly gay individual uh, is something that I have to say I don't think I would wish on anybody because you might as well exist as an alien on another planet or something or you might as well be an alien here on this planet as far as how strange and out of place you feel in that kind of environment. So, uh, growing up in rural Newf Newfoundland, even though I very quickly early on, like in, in, in my um, mid-teenage years, realized the difference of this, I still felt at times, many times over, as if I were the only gay individual on the planet. And uh, because my area of uh, uh, Newfoundland is extremely religiously oriented, uh, even if you don't uh, necessarily classify yourself as a Christian individual, uh, Christianity, uh, that religion, uh, culturally, uh, uh, to an extremely large extent, uh, controls the, the cultural makeup of most of rural Newfoundland, right across the board. Every part of the province you go to in rural Newfoundland, you will find the um, the influence of Christianity, Christian ethics, and all that stuff, which is not necessarily bad. Now, I'm not saying that either. You know that that is that 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 is all wrong as such. But uh, but what I'm saying is that it uh, creates a type of mentality that is um, very dogmatic, very um, um, narrow-minded. Uh, and, and, and very ignorant. Uh, it uh, the type because I deal with it all the time online as well. Uh, fundamental Christian people with their fundamental Christian way of thinking, and it is a uh, perspective and a way of thinking that allows for no difference differences whatsoever. Uh, it's um, and it assumes that it is 100% correct and everything else and everyone else is absolutely 100% incorrect, wrong. So when you grow up in that kind of an atmosphere and if you don't conform, if you don't try your, you know, your damnedest to conform to what people expect that you should be, uh, your life can be, I'm not saying mine was necessarily, but it can be almost a living hell in and of itself. 
because you don't have any support groups, you don't have anybody else around you like yourself that you can talk to. When I was growing up uh, in rural Newfoundland back in the, uh, and this is why I think my, my story is important and people in my category, uh, why our stories are important. Uh, when I grew up in rural Newfoundland back in the uh, 70s, I was born in the mid 60s, I grew up, well, I don't really remember the end of the 60s because I was still too young, but throughout the 70s and the 80s, um, there was nothing available to me. No support group, no people I could I could phone, contact, no way, even if there was, I couldn't, you know, I didn't have my own personal, probably little smartphone and all that sort of stuff, I could make calls left, right and center and whatever kids can do with smartphones nowadays. I didn't have that, you know, none of us did. You know, we had a, a family phone, a landline that was attached to our wall in our living room that the entire house had to hold a, a, a used chair, no privacy or anything. So every call that came in, everybody heard everybody else's conversation, so I think you had no privacy. And so there was no way to, uh, if I wanted to call somebody about this to get advice or to get support or to get whatever, I had no privacy to do any of that. And uh, everything was highly religious, so you had this message continuously pumped into your mind of uh, your lifestyle and your attractions being evil, being dirty, being sick, being perverted. Uh, that you were a dirty little sick little boy that, that was uh, destined for, you know, damnation if you didn't change your ways, if you didn't smarten up and, and, and you didn't change uh, those attractions and that orientation and that way of feeling and all the rest of it didn't give it over to God, give it over to Christ and all that sort of thing um, and try to repent from it you know because I had that kind of stuff pumped in my head all my childhood try to repent from that and uh, live the proper straight decent lifestyle you know that you are a horrible sinner and you are destined for eternal damnation now I have to ask everyone here to please stop and think about this and think about the level of psychological, mental and emotional abuse that is you know, inflicted on, on, on a young child, boy, girl, whatever. To have those kinds of messages pumped into your head for, as far back as you remember that you're a dirty, sick little individual that is, that, that is evil, that you've got some sort of a demon possessing you sort of thing or whatever, that you need to repent over or you're going to go to some place of eternal uh, torture and, 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 and damnation and all that sort of thing. No! You need to understand people, please. You need to understand. Kids can go on and on and on about what they're going through today and all the rest. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not going through a lot of stuff. But uh, this, is, this is what I had to contend with here in Newfoundland, uh, in rural Newfoundland, back in the 70s and the 80s. And probably what kids might have to, any gay kids here in Newfoundland may still, and especially in rural Newfoundland, may still have to contend with even to this very day, sort of thing. And I tried for the longest time, I'm not telling you a word of lie, okay? I tried for the longest time. I, uh, when I was uh, seven years of age, I accepted the existence of a supreme creator of some sort. And shortly after my grandmother passed away and I was going through a lot of stuff then, and I just accepted the existence of God. I still do. I won't get into that right now in, in, in this particular video, but I still do. Uh, and then when I was uh, 12 years of age, I did this thing that we do in all Protestant churches and so on that. I'm from a Salvation Army background. Salvation Army is very predominant here in, New in, in Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Uh, I became a born-again Christian, okay? Well, I tried to become a born-again Christian.